400 of them already cover the planet. Who owns, builds, and ultimately controls this network will be more critical than ever. Peace is a China's cable. It's paid by mainly by a China's operator. Do you know what the most powerful weapon in the world is? It's not a nuclear bomb or an atomic weapon. No, it's a cable. Thousands of miles of fiber strands running along our ocean beds are key to the balance of world power. But how? What makes this cable so significant? And how could it possibly be the most powerful weapon in the world? Join us as we explain how this cable is now the most powerful weapon in the world. This cable is not just any ordinary cable, it's a submarine cable. Submarine cables are cables that carry data across the oceans, connecting continents, and enabling global communication. This particular one is named after a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Henry Dunant. It is Google's second intercontinental internet cable, and it's one of the most powerful cables ever commissioned. With a capacity of nearly 300 terabytes per second, Dunant can handle 5 billion telephone calls per second. That's more than the entire population of Africa. In a few months, Dunant will cover a distance of 6,600 kilometers to connect the U.S. city of Virginia Beach, south of Washington, D.C., to a Google data center in the Belgian city of saint Gislaine. The cable will cross the French coastline, and this first section of the cable, measuring five kilometers, is about to be deployed. But what makes Dunant so special? It's not just its length or speed, but its composition. Dunant is made of fine metal encased in polyethylene or plastic, and these enclose the fiber optic pairs or glass fiber strands through which coded information in the form of light pulses transit at a speed of around 200,000 kilometers per second. This is faster than a jet plane. Dunant is also a 12 fiber pair cable, which means it has 12 pairs of glass fiber strands, each carrying data in both directions. This is twice as many as the previous generation of cables. Dunant is also the first cable to use space division multiplexing or SDM technology, which increases the cable's capacity without increasing its power consumption or cost. Do not as part of a growing network of undersea cables that carry more than 95% of the world's internet traffic. These cables are essential for our modern society as they enable us to access information, communicate with each other, and conduct business across the globe. Laying these cables costs hundreds of millions of dollars, but it is still 10 times less expensive than digging trenches on land and they are more reliable and secure than satellite or wireless connections. Today, we have a map of information highways that shows a network with varying coverage. There are well-connected places like Djibouti in East Africa, the Suez Canal, and the Strait of Malacca, linking the Andaman Sea and the South China Sea. On the other hand, some areas like the Arctic and the waters near North Korea have fewer connections. Some cables are short, like the Amerigo Vespucci, which is only about 85 kilometers long and connects two islands off the coast of Venezuela. Others, like Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Western Europe stretch over 39,000 kilometers from Northern Europe to Australia. The network is expanding rapidly, and at this pace, there might be a thousand cables in operation by 2030. Overall, the turnover worldwide is growing by 11% annually and is expected to reach $22 billion by 2025. Yet, relatively little is known about it. So why? Well, simply put, the industry prefers to keep a low profile and one of the best ways of protecting an undersea cable is to not talk about it. The industry consists of three main players, the cable owners, the cable manufacturers, and the cable installers. The cable owners are usually telecom operators, such as Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, Telecom Italia, Vodafone, and Orange. They own the rights to use the cables and sell bandwidth to other customers. The cable manufacturers are companies like Alcatel Submarine Networks, Subcom, and NEC. They design and produce the cables and equipment that goes with them. The cable installers are companies like Global Marine Systems Limited, which own special ships that lay and repair the cables on the seabed. But there's a new force in the industry, the big five U.S. tech companies, or FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. These internet giants have their own undersea cables, which give them more control over their content and data. For example, Facebook has its own team dedicated to its subsea foundations, and for good reason. In 2013, when Facebook launched the video autoplay feature, it consumed so much bandwidth 
that its IT infrastructure almost collapsed, according to a submarine telecom specialist. Since then, the cable industry has had to adapt to a growing demand from internet giants who want to own their own pipes. This is a major challenge for telecom operators who face increasing competition and pressure from these powerful players. The real power, however, lies not with the owners and manufacturers of these cables, but with the nations over whose territory they are laid. These nations have a huge advantage over others. They can charge hefty fees for the data traffic that passes through their territory. They can also influence the flow of information and the balance of world power. Egypt has been enjoying this privilege for a a long time. The Suez Canal is the shortest route between Europe and Asia for data transmission. For decades, Egypt has collected millions of US dollars from cable operators who use this route. But Google has found a way to bypass Egypt. In 2024, it will launch the Blue Raman cable, which will connect India to Italy through a different path. One part of the cable will go from India to Jordan via Saudi Arabia. The other part will go from Jordan to Italy via Israel. This will not only cut the transport cost in half, but also diversify the information highway. Google's data will no longer depend on Egypt alone. Google is not the only one who is looking for alternatives. The future Europe-Persia Express Gateway EPEG cable, operated by Vodafone and others, will go through Iran. This new map of undersea cables reveals new geopolitics, where some regions and states gain or lose from their location. The Suez Canal, Britain, the Malacca Strait, Djibouti, and Washington State are some of the hotspots that benefit from hosting cables. But they also face competition from other countries that want to expand the reach of the web, such as Australia, France, and Brazil which recently connected to Portugal without crossing the U.S. as usual. In recent years, the global landscape of information highways has undergone a significant transformation. This transformation is characterized by a growing diversification of the network and a corresponding decrease in the traditional dominance of the United States and the United Kingdom as well as Europe in general. This shift is not limited to a single geographical region, but extends across the globe. One noteworthy trend contributing to this evolution is the increasing competition posed by Asian cables that specialize in transporting data, particularly from Africa. This shift in the global internet architecture is not merely a matter of connectivity. It has profound implications for a nation's influence on the global stage and its economic growth. Furthermore, it is essential for the resilience and stability of the global network itself. The digital realm has become a critical arena for nations to assert their presence and strategic interests, making active participation in the expansion of the fiber optic web a top priority for governments worldwide. China, in particular, has emerged as a pivotal player in this transformative process. Leveraging its extensive maritime routes, China is progressively altering the balance of power shifting influence away from Western actors and towards what is commonly referred to as the Global South. This strategic shift was formalized in 2015 when China's National Development and Reform Commission published a groundbreaking report. This report outlined an ambitious and vast transnational project aimed at constructing a global network of fiber optic cables often referred to as the Information Silk Road. Building on this foundation, President Xi Jinping launched an equally ambitious initiative two years prior. This initiative focused on constructing extensive road, rail, and port infrastructure linking China to both West and East Africa via Central Asia and the Indian Ocean. By the projected completion date of 2027, an estimated $1,200 billion will have been invested across approximately 60 countries to realize this ambitious vision. Beijing has now extended its ambitions to include a comprehensive digital program as part of this initiative. China's efforts in this area are substantial with Beijing believed to have either activated or is currently in the process of laying fiber optic networks in as many as 76 countries. These efforts extend beyond China's immediate neighbors, reaching as far as Latin America. One of the most emblematic examples of this global connectivity initiative is the Peace Cable, 
which successfully connected the cities of Karachi in Pakistan and Marseille in France in 2022. China has three outcomes in mind. First, it wants to extend its economic interests. By building more cables, China can offer its own digital services to the rest of the world. These services are provided by its own version of Fang called Batix. Batix consists of Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Xiaomi, which are giants in search engines, e-commerce, online gaming, and connected devices. Together, they are worth $1.885 billion. Second, it wants to expand its political model. China's digital Silk Road already allows it to sell its surveillance technologies to other countries. These technologies include facial recognition, internet censorship, and social credit systems. Third, it wants to protect its security interests. By creating its own communication infrastructure, China intends to challenge the West's dominance over the Internet's core architecture. China sees this dominance as a threat to its sovereignty and stability. China's strategists believe that the struggle for information dominance will greatly influence the outcome of future wars, and they are determined to win the struggle. The role of fiber optic cables in China's soft power is vital. It is the key to connecting and controlling the new silk roads that China is building across the globe. China was once considered too far behind to compete with the likes of the US, UK, France, and Japan in the undersea cable industry. But that changed with Huawei. The multinational company had already mastered optical technologies and terminals in the early 2000s, but it needed to learn how to make cables. It had the skills to make repeaters, which boost the signals and the cables, but it borrowed the skills to connect and seal them from Alcatel and Subcon contractors. Huawei also saw a partner in the UK, one of the biggest undersea cable installers in the world. It was Global Marine, and Huawei pitched its vision and expertise in fiber optic systems. Global Marine was interested in the Chinese market and agreed to join forces. In 2008, they formed a joint venture called Huawei Marine Networks. Several British consultants also helped with their expertise. According to many sources, this joint venture enabled Huawei to acquire Global Marine's technology over 10 years. But Huawei did not stop there. The British consultants also introduced Huawei to their network of suppliers, aluminum, copper, electronic components, welders, and stranding machines. This was a whole ecosystem that was new to Huawei, and the Chinese gained 10 years of experience in the whole affair. The joint venture thrived until 2019, when Global Marine sold its share in Huawei Marine Networks, along with its fleet of cable ships, to the Chinese company Hingtong Optic Electric for $285 million. This deal made Hingtong one of the few companies to have complete control over the fiber optic value chain, cables, repeaters, terminals, and fleet. The stakes are high. China's digital Silk Road requires it to secure its cable infrastructure, which could be a prime target in a conflict. The West, aware of the security of its information highways, has already recognized this challenge. Rishi Sunak, long before he became the prime minister, warned about this risk in a report he published in 2017. In the report's introduction, written by Admiral James Stavridis, he said, The risk posed to these connections that carry everything from military intelligence to global financial data is real and growing. The slightest attack, he continued, would be potentially catastrophic. The report also pointed out that Russia could be tempted to cut telecommunication cables, as it did in Crimea, to control the information flow during a war. Or Moscow could use its submarines to spy on the cables carrying data. The possibility of such a threat is controversial. But former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, who is now the deputy chairman of the country's Security Council, said this year that Moscow had no moral limits to stop it from destroying its enemies' undersea cables. Something like that happened last October when a cable that provides internet to the Shetland Islands was cut in two places, causing internet disruptions. Some people were of the opinion that it was an accident, maybe caused by a fishing boat. But others suspected that a Russian underwater research ship had something to do with it. At that time, Foreign Secretary James Cleverly said, We're constantly having to defend ourselves against digital attack from state and non-state actors. Deliberate sabotage aside, submarine cables are also vulnerable to accidental damage, whether environmental or by ships or sea life. 
Each year, around 150 cases of cable damage are reported, highlighting the vulnerability of these critical infrastructure components. Surprisingly, the primary threat to these cables comes from the anchors of fishing boats and cargo ships, surpassing the risk posed by offshore wind farms and deepwater drilling activities. The challenge here is that the responsibility for repairs typically falls on the vessel's captain or their insurer, with potential cost reaching as high as $1 million. This can lead to tensions between cable operators and the fishing industry, as coexistence isn't always peaceful. Furthermore, the increasing frequency of hurricanes can exacerbate the problem by causing shifts in the seafloor potentially compromising specific sections of the cable network. Additionally, marine life, such as sharks, can contribute to damage by biting through the cable insulation, posing an unexpected threat to the stability of the network. As a result of all of this, ocean emergency brigades are constantly patching up cables and dispatching submersibles that can identify the damaged section before replacing it. According to an undersea cable specialist, if cable ships weren't spending their time repairing them, the world's internet would be down and barely a few months. In the end, beneath the entertaining cat videos, humorous gifs, and memes that fill the internet, users should recognize that there's a profound power struggle taking place. This battle for dominance unfolds on multiple fronts involving major corporations and nation states, and it's happening at an astonishingly rapid pace. What do you think about this? Let us know in the comments section below.